History tells of people where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. Most important, history tells a people where they still must go and what they still must be. The relationship of history to the people is the same as the relationship of a mother to her child. There's something about an island of body of water that creates a special kind of dreamer because they did not know where they came from in Africa. They dreamed of the whole of it, bring it all together in one piece. The seeds of Pan-Africanism planted in the United States during slavery years later flourish in the fertile soil of the British West Indies. Trinidad produced the three greatest Pan-Africanists, H. Sylvester Williams, C.L.R. James, and George Padmore. In Trinidad, they found, found the Pan-African League. H. Sylvester Williams would eventually call it Pan-African. He would call a conference in London in 1900. A few scattered Africans, a few people from the Caribbean, W. E. Du Bois from the United States. They did not ask for the in independence of African states then. They asked for preparation. Give us the kind of education that will prepare us for eventual independence. They were reasonable, but they weren't listened to. And yet the conference made some kind of impression after the first Congress. Du Bois would be the leading light from the second through fourth, but the most meaningful, the one that Du Bois called in Paris, as a result of this Congress, Du Bois came to center stage as the leader and theoretician of Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism wasn't exactly new because black Americans were practicing it long before someone gave it a name the African settlement movement, the movement that settled Liberia, was in form of Pan-African movement. The so-called Negro Convention movement was most a discussion of how you bring the African world together. That whole 19th century was Pan-African thought. Prince Hall, his development of the black Masonic order that he called the African Lodge. The search for a place in Africa for settlement by Martin Delaney and Robert Campbell. 1829, David Walker's appeal to the colored people of the world was basically a pan-African appeal. All of this, before we come down to the end of the 19th century, the ultimate Pan-Africanist, of course, was the Jamaican Marcus Garvey. Citizens of Africa, I greet you in the name of the Universal Negro Movement Association and African Communities League of the World. You may ask, what organization is that? It is for me to inform you that the Universal Negro Movement Association is an organization that seeks to unite into one solid body the 400 million Negroes of the world. It was soon after the end of World War One, the Secretary of War had told the black American soldiers that their lot would not 
be appreciably changed by virtue of the fact that they fought in the war. There had been an investigation. It was discovered that many of the nurses wouldn't treat black soldiers in the hospital, wouldn't even touch them. Some of them died as a result. So you have these grievances pent up in the veteran coming home. All of this came to a head in 1919 when there were riots all over the United States that called the Red Summer. Marcus Garvey could point out, look, they don't want you here. Let's go back home. Let's go to Africa. Go back to Africa. Let's not only go back to Africa, let's go back in our own ships. Now, a whole lot of people who otherwise would not listen are now willing to listen. We hear the cry of France for the Frenchmen, of Germany for the Germans, of Ireland for the Irish, of Japan for the Japanese. We of the Universal Negro Poet Association are raising the cry of Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. He began to dream the great dream and rescue the mind of millions of black Americans from depression and self-doubt. By 1923, he was in some difficulty with the boats and some of the people he had hired to run the boats, terrible mismanagement and betrayal. He collected millions of dollars from black Americans to buy these boats, and these boats were old and not as seaworthy as he thought they were. Garvey moved over large territory, maybe too fast, and yet he built the largest movement in black America before our sense. That needs to be a reassessment of Marcus Garvey and his long-reaching effects. He called attention to what slavery and colonialism had taken away. They took away a concept essential to all the people in the world. They took away the concept of state management and state maintenance. Once you are taken from the geography of your origin and forced to live in a state designed by others, you're still the slave to the man who's astute enough to control a container called the state. 